This is a huge stage. I'm only halfway there. OK, so this is my first slide, and it kind of tripped out the tech people because it looks broken. Um, <laughs> but I want to talk about big design troubles in open source. Um, oh, yeah, here, big. Is, this is the biggest word I put on a screen, by the way, um, ever. Design troubles, open source. All right. And that's the face I make a lot when I'm designing. Um, and I wanted to talk about why and how we can improve that. Uh, I'm Michael Arsted. I work at Automatic. And uh, most of the projects I work on happen to be open source. And I've contributed quite a bit to open source projects um, throughout the years. Uh, so I love it. It's a, it's a great community. There's great people. And I've learned a ton of things on all sorts of subjects across the years. Uh, most of what I did at first was a, a bunch of ooh, CSS things. I was one slide behind on my screen. And uh, then I started getting into some bigger projects. I jumped into uh, a WordPress a little bit. Um, and it wasn't necessarily out of passion, which I'll talk about later, but it then evolved into a passion. Um, and now I work on Jetpack and uh, Calypso, which is the React-based interface for WordPress.com. And uh, let's see, I have just a little bit of experience behind me on this. Let's see here. So I want to talk about onboarding designers to start. That's where uh, open source projects usually have a rough time. Uh, it starts when a designer gets a little curious, they have an itch, and they discover a project that sort of helps them with that, but they find they have the skills necessary to improve the project for other people. Um, but it's usually a project built by developers, by developers, um, and just for developers, hoping to solve a project or a problem. So if they join the project finally, they have to get past these preconceived notions. Um, I want to talk about those first. Uh, first of all, open source is code. This is usually what my screen happens to look like. And a lot of the time, open source projects are really code based, uh, but they could all use design in any sense on tickets, sketches, wireframes, any, any level of design. So it doesn't have to be just code. Um, another preconception is that open source projects are very difficult. Uh, that's not true. There's a lot of really, really cool projects, really new projects, that if you're jumping in early, it's really easy to get started. They have no rules. Um, the, world's, the world's your oyster on those projects. But some of the more established projects have just tons of commits. And even this Gutenberg, which we've been talking about all week, it's already at uh, 1,700 commits with 32 contributors. Uh, it, it's already kind of a pretty popular established project, so it may be a little intimidating to start. Uh, fortunately, this one's rather easy. Um, and that open source is slow. And that, that is largely driven by the fact that it's hard for people to convince developers out of the blue to switch what they're doing and work on their cool design thing. Um, but open source is actually really fast. This is just a bunch of active tickets from the last couple of days. And they tend to open and close really quickly. People are solving things so quickly. It's just a matter of convincing people to work on your project. So it can move pretty quickly uh, with the right group and after making a, little, uh, a few friends. And uh, some, of the, some of the rougher parts of the project are caused directly because they're developer-led. Uh, the tools are for the developers. And uh, I want to start with, basically, the tools for the developers allow the developers to have control over the project. They're really comfortable with these tools, and they use them all the time. These aren't tools people outside of the developer realm are used to. So Terminal is a scary thing, and it's the primary tool for building projects. Uh, there are some GUIs for building SaaS and, and some other things like that. CodeKit's a good one. But uh, most of the tools, you got to open up Terminal and understand some basic Terminal language. Uh, then there's the communication tools. These are pretty rough in some communities. Um, they tend to be like IRC, Track. Uh, Chromium uses some crazy bug tracker that I've 
never seen before, but it's really uh, kind of scary looking. Um, and then there's collaboration tools like, uh, again, Slack and IRC are, are really pretty good. IRC has a bunch of web portals. Uh, Slack is very friendly and has emoji support, <laughs> which I love. Um, but my recommendation is to use modern tools with wider reach. So instead of sticking to your, you know, your old tools because you like them, uh, look at where designers are, or look where other people are collaborating that aren't developers, and, and find something that's a little more uh, useful. Um, GitHub isn't ideal. It's not perfect. But that's where a lot of people, a lot of designers are contributing, because they've done a good job working with the interface to help collaboration along. Uh, with WordPress specifically, we do almost all of our feature projects on GitHub now. And uh, that's, I think that's a good telling sign. When we're on GitHub, they get all these contributors out of nowhere. Uh, they move really quickly. People are creating and busting through issues really quickly. It may not scale for WordPress, but it's working really well for our, uh, our projects themselves. Then once we merge those projects back in, we see a huge drop off in those contributors continuing to work on those projects. And partially, the projects are moved in, but there's usually a lot of issues remaining. My next recommendation uh, for onboarding is to make, make the projects really accessible. So again, I'm going to promote GitHub, because that's where a lot of people are. That's where a lot of code is happening. But there's also new, cooler ones, like Glitch is this app sort of collaboration project that all sorts of really experimental things are popping up from, um, from artists, from developers, from just all sorts of cool, cool uh, ends of the job spectrum. And uh, provide design tools. We do an OK job of that. We've got templates. Um, we've got some wireframing tools. Uh, prototyping we could do a little bit better with, but we're working on it. Um, and testing. This is a really big one. It's so easy to test. And we've now got a testing group. They're leading the way. They're helping out in any way they can to get these new projects tested, um, which makes just better, better design. And then design docs. As you just saw in the last talk, design docs are really important. And I think a project having a pretty comprehensive set showing that there's design thinking is important for recruiting, uh, especially design talent, because they'll see that there's design thinking. They're uh, focused on improving the project. They've got some idea of where they're going. And they're providing tools for the designers uh, across the board to be on the same page. This, we, we have some really rough starts to it. but. Uh, nothing comprehensive. But I'd like to move on to retention a little bit. Retention's where our biggest problem is. It's not necessarily recruiting, especially with designers. Um, the biggest reason, I think, is time commitment. It's, it's a huge amount of time to contribute to design on a project uh, of any scale. You've got to find do a little bit of research to understand the problem. You've got to come up with a solution to that problem. You've got to test out that solution a couple of times, wireframe, whatever it is, work with people to convince them to implement that problem. And that's if everything goes perfectly. Um, we need to do a much better job respecting, respecting people's time in this. Uh, with development, it appears easy to jump in fix a bug and jump out. With design, that's not really so clear. You might jump in to fix something um, and spend a week in a, uh, a rabbit hole of bugs to just fix one border. So I don't have a great suggestion for this other than more companies could donate some time, some designer time, whether that's partially uh, funding a designer to work on a project or just uh, fully fund. Like, we've got several full-time developers. We've got several uh, full-time committers paid for by other companies to work on core, work on the community. And it shows. They're leaders in the community. They're always around. They've accomplished some of the hard tasks that aren't accomplishable in a short amount of time. Right now, there are, I think, the most designers we've ever had in core. We've got 
two or three people, no, I think four now, working full time on specific projects, but they're all focused on their corner of the woods. Or one person, two, two of them are working on Gutenberg, one is working on a, a customization, Mel, and uh, I don't know where the other one is. <laughs> um, another thing that scares people away is community pushback. This happens in every open source community. Some are worse than others. Uh, some communities are not very welcome to newcomers. They expect you to know the rules. They expect you to know history you may not know. And quite often, read the manual, RTFM, is the response you'll get when you, when you post something unexpectedly. Even when you post a design that's really complete or fully thought out, you'll still get a lot of pushback. Um, we often encourage our designers, when we're first onboarding them, to do a smaller bug, like fix a button color or something like that. Now, one of the problems with that is that it's really easy for anyone that's not a designer to also understand that problem. And uh, that ends up in everyone chiming in, because they all have their own ideas how that button color should be. That's called bike shedding. And uh, it's a huge time sink. Uh, basically, there's no clear winner on that one. If you're new to a project, who's to say you have the right answer over all these strangers or people that may have been around um, telling you you're wrong or that their idea might be better? That's a really quick way to chase someone away. Now, these are my favorite ones. These are where I get caught up on and just about every ticket I do. Uh, and I've got a good, good idea of why. It's partially because WordPress is 14 years old, which is awesome. I've never worked on a project this old before uh, because it keeps getting older. So the technical limitations involve technical debt, design debt. They've been designed over 14 years. And a lot of stuff has been forgotten, not iterated on. Uh, whoever implement them is no longer around. And it's hard to always know the history of that. Uh, so you get these unexpected requirements that you would never, no one even mentions, uh, even before something's merged in. For example, if you change this button at all, you would never know that if you made the colors slightly different, that you would have to meet accessibility guidelines. You would have to understand the implications of how it might look in another language or at a different size, how it wraps. Uh, even if it's just a color change and you commit it, which I've done, you might get a ping a week later that says, well, hey, you did this here, but what about the color schemes? So you go, OK, well, where's the CSS for the color schemes? Turns out it's SAS. There's a build process involved. You have to figure out what grunt and terminal and this stuff is, and you're gone. Uh, that's, that's one of the faces I make when I run into those. Now, uh, Mel mentioned when I was talking to her that retaining contributors is more important than perfection. And I think that's one of the most brilliant insights uh, I've heard when it comes to contributing. Like, we need contributors to stay around, even if they're submitting imperfect things. Let's help them. Let's grow them. Let's keep them excited and involved. They're there for a really, really good reason. And we want to keep them. So provide loads of, of feedback, but make sure it's encouraging. Um, be patient with them. Don't tell them to read the manual. Tell them, hey, we do this for this reason. Um, what do you think about trying this? Here's more information on it, that kind of thing. Don't just link them and dump them. And uh, constructive feedback's really important. Give them feedback right away. And this goes to any, not just design, anyone who's commenting. If something sits too long, it's really uh, kind of demotivating. So someone posts a proposal. They've got some code in there. Let's get in as quick as possible. Core is really good about that. Uh, very few tickets sit for too long, unless they're super difficult or way out of scope. Uh, for example, if I posted a ticket like, WordPress should have an editor like Medium, uh, that may not stick around for very long. But someone could be really nice about it and say, hey, we're working on this other thing called Gutenberg. It's really nice. Please come on over and check it out. 
It's not medium. It's going to be way better than medium. That kind of thing. And uh, there's no one to make decisions for you. You've got to help them make the decision and understand when decisions are kind of handed down from team leads for historical reasons or something like, don't just say no. Say, we can't do this because the API limits us from doing it right now and we're working on it. That kind of a thing. And constantly do your part to keep them involved. Uh, if they've disappeared off the face of the planet, and this goes for any contributor, ping them, say hi. You don't have to convince them to contribute, but just the fact that you're seeing how they're doing. They might have a life thing come up. Um, they may really want to get back on the project. This happens all the time. And most of all, be a mentor. Uh, so when someone new comes in and they see talent or or excitement. Like, we have young people all the time come in. I think there was a, like, a 12-year-old who was helping Adam last year uh, fix the REST API, which was pretty cool. Um, but they helped mentor this person just along, even though this person was correcting their code. I think that's how Nason got, got pretty far, is he had a lot, of, a lot of help, and he learned quick. Um, but these are just like recruiting and onboarding, uh, recruiting and retention problems. Uh, those, those, I think, can boost our numbers and help distribute design a little more evenly across WordPress. But there's a few more um, pretty big design, design troubles. And I think the biggest elephant that came up over the last few days is, is design leadership. Um, right now, we have kind of a big a gap there. We've got leadership on specific focuses and projects, but there's no one guiding where WordPress could go. There's no one orga organizing style guides or uh, how components can work together across the board, thinking holistically about the product. Um, we are doing better with this as we've gotten more designers, more people are communicating with each other. But currently, it's, it's, there's, there's, no, there's no team leads that are just telling people what we should be doing or where we're going. But that's not a problem. That means that's a huge opportunity for, for new designers to come in, new talent, and help guide the process themselves. Like the, it's, democrat, it's a democracy, essentially. Uh, the longer you're around, um, the more you're familiar with the project, and the more weight your words will have when you uh, try to swing one direction or another or convince us that maybe we don't need menu groups or that widgets shouldn't exist because they should just be in something like Gutenberg, that kind of stuff. And, uh, oh, just covered that. Design vision, because there's no one with this super clear vision of where things are going, which I think is kind of a myth most of the time. Uh, it just comes from whoever's, whoever's working on a project. This can be really good, and sometimes it's really clear. Like Gutenberg, you can already see the vision in that video of where it could go, how it can influence themes and plugins. Um, but it's not always super clear, like what happens with custom post types, that kind of thing. And design consistency. We, this, is, this is a pretty big problem on old projects because they're often designed by like 100 people over 10 years, uh, and it shows. So like the, the con comment section might be super different than how you manage pages, that kind of stuff. Um, there's no one really heading a project to rearrange that or fix that. So those are, those are, that's a, I think that's a common open source project that, or open source problem that kind of plagues some projects. A lot of bits get left behind as they are no longer the new thing. They no longer have developers who are interested in working on it. And it's hard for designers with, with limited amount of time to go and redesign 10 sections that work on mobile. They've tested them. They dramatically changed users' experiences. That's a, that's a big deal, and it's very difficult to do. Um, so that's why, you know, over time, things get a little rough. Um, and our design process is slowly improving. Right now, it's a little open-ended, but I think Gutenberg, again, is a really good example of how the design process can be in the open. They're showing their steps. They're keeping people along for the ride. They're not just showing up at the end, going, ta-da, here's, I hope you like this. 
Um, they're asking for opinions, and they're showing every step of the way uh, how they can make a great product. Now, I'm pretty optimistic about the future of open source and about WordPress itself, um, specifically WordPress because we have a huge year right now. We have Gutenberg working pr pretty f amazingly for how quickly it's been put together. We have a customizer focus, a customization focus, I'm sorry. We have folks like John Maida spreading the, the open source word on his networks. We have uh, the REST API is now in, so we can do all sorts of really cool design stuff this year. And uh, we even have a, de a developer and design co-lead on some stuff. Now, I want to make it even more designy for everyone. So I want you all, if you're a designer or not, to start thinking about design, get into design thinking. And uh, I think some of the other speakers talked about this a little bit. But uh, it has nothing to do with form. It's not how pretty things look. Uh, I don't care if you use blue or green, um, that kind of stuff. It's entirely about function. It's the product itself. It's how a thing works. That's, that's what we're trying to get at. We're trying to make something that works really well for the people that use it. And so that starts with some empathy. You have to talk to a lot of people. You have to use the product yourself. You have to try all these things. Uh, if you're building a blogging platform, blog, build sites, uh, try to break it, do all sorts of things with it, and not just one site, like 10 sites. And that, again, takes time, but it's worth it. It's how you build empathy. Um, just the other day, I was trying out a product that's established um, uh, and running through a flow. It was, it was actually Jetpack. I was running through a sign-up flow, and I think on the 10th different variation I did, I ran into something that was like kind of frustrating for me as a designer. Uh, it could be frustrating for users because they don't really know what it means, but it wasn't really a huge blocker, but it was something that we immediately m made an effort to make better because we caught it. Um, that's, that's super important that we do that. And uh, again, don't think in features. That's, that's an old mindset. That's how you accumulate settings. Uh, it's also how <laughs> Weird things like menu grouping happens when someone comes along and says, well, we want to use this menu over here and over here. Instead of just saying, OK, let's do that. Let's do this and like, make this feature a thing. You've got to stop and say, why? Who's this helping? Is this going to be more confusing in the end of the day? Um, that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's all in flows. Like, that's thinking about how to a user needs to have a menu in three places. That doesn't necessarily need to, I mean, they have to have a group that uses the same thing in a confusing context. They could just mirror some things or add some quick flows that work really well, um, which simplifies as menus. It makes it so that newer users, newer site creators, businesses can work with this without building a menu and getting confused as to why it's not showing up somewhere. Um, so I'm just reaching out, help us design some stuff. It doesn't have to be WordPress, though I recommend it. But uh, there's lots of projects out there. A lot of them are beginning. And the earlier you get in, the more exciting it is. You have some sway. You'll learn a lot. You'll, have your, you'll learn some code even. You'll learn terminal. It won't be so, super scary after a while. And you'll be able to improve yourself as a designer, because you'll get really, really familiar with the medium. So thank you. Now, ask me whatever you want. I don't know how much time we have. We've got a bit of time. We've got a bit of time. This is your chance to quiz one of the core team. Any questions you have about design, about the process that gets us to design, uh, please take your chance now. We've got the usual situation with the mics down at the front. Do we have any questions? Who's got first? We have a question coming in from down below. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm from Poland. Uh, and I have a question. How did you start? Like, uh, how did you get involved with working for Automatic? Did you have? I got really mad at WordPress one day. Yeah, and how the, did you have already like a portfolio or uh, of ready made projects? How did it work? So I'd already done um, some playing on GitHub and some open source or web projects. I'd done a lot of web work and freelance work. 
which is why I got mad at WordPress. <laughs> I found a really blatant bug, got really mad at it, and was like, I'm going to fix WordPress. And <laughs> it turns out that's harder than I thought. Uh, How's that going? <laughs> but I jumped in, I had lots of opinions, um, and then the leads and the, the, the core developers dropped in and said, hey, you know, I mean, I wasn't cursing or anything, but they were like, calm down. We know you're excited. Why don't we tackle this one, one issue at a time? Let's, let's break this up into manageable things. I was like, OK. So that's how I got started in WordPress. I jumped in on a project called CEUX, which was content editor user experience or something like that. Essentially, it was Gutenberg way ahead of its time. It was a blocks interface that let us do a lot of cool things that I was mad about. So I listened. I learned a lot. Um, Mel would happen to be leading that project, uh, which, was, which was kind of a, a good and a bad thing. Like I was like, is there anything I can do to help? And she's like so on it with design. She was like, no, nah, I got this. Uh, so I just kind of sat back and did some helpful mock-ups, made some smaller decisions along with it. And then when we realized it maybe wasn't going to work or wasn't ready to work in, in, in scope of technical limitations, it was kind of pushed aside. But there is a cool plugin out there that you can still mess with it a little bit. <laughs> Mike, can I ask, you kind of wear two hats then. So you have a role on the open source.org side. You also have a role uh, on the Jetpack side. Mm -hmm. How do those two roles differ, if at all? OK, so I think the type of open source projects dramatically differ. So WordPress.org is entirely run by the community. Like, it's built by the community. Uh, it's a very community-centric project. Um, Jetpack is built primarily by autom Automatic. Uh, it's built by, it's paid, paying a lot of people to work and improve it. That said, we get. Uh, plenty of community contributions. And we listen and work with the community uh, on many things. We're often adding uh, nifty secret tools and things to help out people in the community on specific sites. We have great support, that kind of thing. So it's still a community project, and anyone contributes, can contribute to it, but it's guided by a specific entity, mostly. Sure. We have a question down below again. Thank you. Oh. Can we, can we try again down here? Yes, yes. go. Hi, Michael. Uh, I'd like you to know what you think about the current usage data and user data that we have on WordPress. And I'd like to know if, do you think, <coughs> sorry, do you think we have enough to take well-informed decision about design and even more with such new projects coming up? Shouldn't we invest time and energy uh, to build better usage data? Yeah, so to answer, those are two questions. One, do we have enough data to make informed design decisions? And two, uh, can we have better data, right? Yep. OK, so the first one, yeah, we do have enough design, or we do have enough user feedback or us usability feedback to make design decisions. Um, some of it is coming from places like WordPress.com. Some of it are coming from other, other sources. We do a lot of research. Um, but a lot of it just comes from talking with users, um, documenting problems they have, figuring out who's using our stuff. We still don't have, like, like I don't know who's using WordPress. Like, it's the top 20, it's, what is it? Top 25 million sites we're 28% of or something like that. I have no idea how many sites there are that are WordPress um, and active. I think that's. At, the best guess we have is probably in the plugin directory or somewhere in one of those stats. Uh, we do have pretty good stats on active plugins and what plugins are used, so we can make some deductions there. For example, uh, I believe the top 100 plugins on the plugin directory, top most active, are, uh, account for about 90 plus percent of plugins installed. We know that on average, people have six plugins installed and active. Uh, the top I think six of the plugins in the plugin directory account for a, a pretty large portion of that percentage as well. Um, so we, we, we can make some good deductions as to who's using it as for why and what they're looking for. So we can make some pretty good design decisions for things like where we put a button or a publishing flow. 
that, that's harder to do um, because we don't have a beta program or anything quite like that. We've made steps towards that. Like we do have a beta channel you can be in on plugins if you're on a developer version. Um, we have made projects a little more visible, but we do a lot of usability tests early and often. So with Gutenberg, we already, we're already testing it. We've tested the prototypes. We're testing it, how it is right now. And every time we test it, it only takes a couple of people to figure out where things are broken or inform our design decisions as to where we can maybe improve. So I think we have a lot of data. It could definitely improve. Um, I think it's a matter of exposing that data in a better way is primarily the problem. It takes a lot of legwork currently. Mike, there has been some discussion about uh, having WordPress sites phone home to yeah. deliver clearer, more granular data. What's your position on that? What's the core team's position on that? I don't know what the core team's position on. <laughs> I'm not speaking for the core team. Uh, I think it's a, it's a kind of controversial topic, and I don't know enough. I think it potentially, uh, I think it scares a lot of people for privacy concern reasons. Um, it could definitely be something that we opt people into or give them the option for. Kind of like when you're signing up for a browser and asks you, hey, can I gather usability data? And you say, no, because you're paranoid like me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what the best answer to that is because it's a complicated technological question. It could expose a lot of data publicly on accident um, sure. if it's all going to like WordPress.org or one of those servers. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know uh, enough about it. Cool. I would love to have that data for sure. <laughs> I'll let um, you off the hook for now. We have another question down here. Hi. Uh, what inspires you to improve design or what, what places do you look for and trends? Are you looking at oh. uh, in, in terms of publishing platforms yeah. like, like, like Squarespace is, I know Gutenberg's coming in, so I guess that's a two-part question. And one is, what actually inspires you to do, do the design in a, in a good way, and also trends? OK, so that's a good question. Where do I find inspiration, and w am I looking at trends? So yes, I'm looking at trends uh, to help. I'm looking at a lot of places for trends. Like when we look at editors for Gutenberg, for example, we looked at like a gazillion editors and where they're going. But then we were like, well, how are the editors supposed to look if we had like the perfect editor five years from now? Uh, and I think those are kind of influenced by, you know, sci-fi movies a little bit, and books. Like I read a lot of books. And uh, I think that's the best place you can get inspiration. Like how would this work in an ideal situation? And how can we get there? You don't have to design and build something at that end point right away. You can iterate towards that. So um, I think I was watching somebody use like a tablet. Oh, it was uh, the latest Apple whatever developer conference or something where he was like swiping around and doing all this minority report stuff. I think that was probably influenced by Minority Report <laughs> indirectly, but it was very, very futuristic, very cool. And I think what we're trying to do is look to, to the future as opposed to what's trending now. So if you know, flat design was really, really trending, we didn't decide, oh, we need to do flat design because it's trending. We decided we needed to improve our interface, design language across the board. Here's the best we can do for now, and we think it's a little bit more future-proof than some of the stuff we were doing before, that kind of thing. Uh, we also think, think about the future in almost every decision, rather than making this cooler for now, like how, how is this going to last? How is this going to hold up over time? So that's, that's, that's a lot of what we take into consideration, yeah. Cool. And I'm going to take one more question, and this is the last question of WordCamp Europe 2017. Make it a good one. OK. <laughs> um, thank you, Michael. As a designer, I am interested in the tools you, you usually use. Um, I would like to know specifically what you use for wireframing, prototyping, um, designing, and then uh, testing. OK, so this is it's a really a four ephemeral part question. OK, cool. <laughs> yeah, much. I can list them off, but it's a very ephemeral question because they, they, they change all the time, right? There's a different tool every day. So let's start at the beginning, wireframing. Uh, I still use a lot of sketches. The it might be on a device, might be on a sketchbook. 
um, might be in the, the app Sketch. I use the app Sketch for quite a lot of things. Uh, we use all sorts of different uh, sets of software for prototyping right now, Envisions, uh, one, of, one of the most used ones at the company. Um, but we can also do things like, we also do like keynote mockups and things like that that are a little, little faster to build sometimes. Uh, let's see, what was it? testing? Oh, we just, I mean, testing could be as simple as just like sitting down with a buddy who's not super familiar with what you're working on mm -hmm. and uh, just having them do a couple of things. You'll find out really quickly <laughs> whether your design patterns are messed up. And sometimes you're designing something that's living within something else that might be a, a blocker. But uh, we also use, I think we've used usability test, testing in the past. We use various screen recorders, QuickTime even. We'll record people and their actions. Um, when we are doing usability tests, we often have a very clear script so it's repeatable. And we have people read their thoughts out loud, which is really helpful um, when they're confused or looking for something we know exactly what they're trying to do. Fantastic. Folks, can we give it up, please? One last time from Mike Arstad.